Our subject this evening is an extremely important one. Why many do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Perhaps you've read how the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost and how people spoke in different tongues. There have been a lot of people who have sought the baptism of the Holy Spirit and prayed for it and have never received it. I'm sure some of you have been asked if you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. It's vitally important that we understand this because there are reasons why so many do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what Pastor Cox is speaking about tonight. So let's join him for his fascinating topic, why many do not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm very happy to welcome each of you again tonight. A lot of people have picked up the Bible and have read in the book of Acts how that the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost and all the miraculous things that happened there as people began to speak in other languages. And as they have read through the Scripture, they have seen incident after incident many, many times where the Holy Spirit fell on people and through the ministry of the Spirit, great miracles were done. And individuals have prayed. They've looked. They've read the Scripture. They've asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and never have received it. And never have understood why. They never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet the Scripture tells us it's something that you and I should pray for, that should be part of our Christian experience. And so tonight, we're going to take a look at some scriptural reasons why people don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to look at tonight. You remember, Christ has died. With his death, all the hopes, all the ambitions, all the desires of the disciples died with them. Word has trickled across Jerusalem that he has risen. And the disciples have gone out to the tomb. And it says it came to pass as they were greatly perplexed about this. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Two angels standing there in shining garments. And they said this to them. And as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? They said, Why are you seeking the living among the dead, and they told him that he is risen and they would meet him out around Galilee. And you remember, they went there and Jesus spent 40 days with those disciples. During that 40 days, he taught them. But just before he left, he told them that they were to go to Jerusalem. They were to tarry there and pray until they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. With the baptism of the Holy Spirit, certain things were going to happen. And notice what it says here in Acts 1 and verse 8. It says, but you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He told them they were to meet there, they were to pray, and with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they would receive power to do what? To witness. And they would be witnesses of him in different places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, with this, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, certain things happened. Let me illustrate what I mean. You remember Peter? Uh, the mob has come. They have arrested Christ. They've taken him back to the home of the high priest. Evidently, John knows somebody in the high priest's home because he was able to get he, himself, and Peter into the home out in the courtyard. It's in the early morning hours. They're standing there by, around the fire when this girl speaks to Peter and says, aren't you one of his disciples? And he says, no. I'm not one of his disciples. And then a little bit somebody else says, haven't we seen you with him? And again he denies him. And then they say, your speech betrays thee. And with words of cursing, he denies his Lord. And you remember the cock crew. 
Peter left, went back out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there poured out his soul to the Lord. Okay, that's happened. Now we've come about 50 days, 50 days later. The same man, Peter, is now at the temple. He's preaching about Jesus Christ, and as he's preaching about Jesus Christ, he's arrested. He's taken in before the Sanhedrin, and they have charged him straightly, saying, you're not to preach Jesus Christ. And Peter stands before that ruling body, and he says to him, yes, you're the ones that crucified him. What has changed this man? What has made this man different? A man that couldn't even stand the investigation of a little girl now standing before the whole ruling body and saying, you're the ones that crucified him. What's changed him? It says, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall receive power. Definite change in his life. Now, you see Philip, the deacon Philip. He's gone down into Samaria and he's preaching the gospel in Samaria. It says, and when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. It says Philip went down to Samaria and he preached Jesus Christ and men and women accepted him and they were baptized. That's what's been happening here. A lot of you are going to be baptized tomorrow. We've been preaching Jesus Christ and many of you by faith have reached out and accepted him and you're going to follow the Lord in baptism tomorrow. That's part of the preaching of the gospel. Now listen to what happens. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Now Philip's down there preaching, and so many people have turned out, so many have come, that they say, well, Philip needs some help. And so they've sent Peter and John down to help him. They've come down. Help Philip there in Samaria. Now listen to what begins to happen. Who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Are you getting it clear? They have received the gospel. They have accepted Jesus Christ. They have been baptized by water, but they have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. Okay? For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had only been baptized with water. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So it says they prayed for them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you tonight to get something real clear before we go on into this, because I don't want you mixed up. The Bible speaks of two things. It speaks of being born of the Spirit. When a person accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, at that point the person is baptized, excuse me, is born of the Spirit. When they accept Jesus Christ, they are born of the Spirit. I am given a new nature. I become a new creature in Christ. That's receiving the new birth. Later, sometimes, a person may be baptized of the Spirit. I can show you cases in Scripture. When people accepted Christ, they were baptized of the Holy Spirit. I can also show you cases as here in Samaria where they were baptized and did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit until later. But these are two different experiences. This is when an individual accepts Christ, he is born of the Spirit. He later or at that time may be baptized of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is given for what purpose? It's given to make us witnesses. Understand the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to make you an effective witness for Jesus Christ. Dear friends, this is not a second work of grace. Don't put it down there. This is when you are born again. This is when you receive eternal life. This is not a second work of grace. This is given to you to make your witness effective. Okay? Now that we have that clear, let's look at some facts of what the Scripture says about it. Many individuals, many people 
never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they're unwilling to give up known sin. I'm not talking about when you stump your toe. I'm not talking about when the devil breathes down your neck and makes it hard to breathe. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit has convicted you of a sin and you know it's wrong and you refuse to give it up. Dear friends, many people never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they're unwilling to give up a sin that the Holy Spirit has convicted them of. Let's look at an example. This is happening down in Samaria. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. This man, Simon, he was among those that accepted Christ. He had been baptized by water, and when he saw those disciples laying hands on the people and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he said, here, I'll give you some money if you'll give me that power. You know, there are some people that believe you can buy anything with money, but there are some things you can't buy, dear friend, not with money. Saying, give me this power also that on whomever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Spirit. Then Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter for your heart is what? Not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I perceive that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound in iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which I have spoken may come upon me. Dear friend, you cannot, and the Holy Spirit has brought conviction to your heart and you know something's wrong, you cannot continue to do that over and over and over and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Bible says you become the vessel of the Holy Spirit. That's what it tells you. Listen. Therefore, if anyone cleanse himself from these, he will be a vessel for what? Honor, sanctified, and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. It says, you see, that this vessel must be clean. The Holy Spirit must use it. Let me tell you right now, you don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses you. God is not going to take someone who is unwilling to give up a known sin and pour out power upon that person. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Therefore, he asked, that you and I surrender it. And let me tell you something, it's not hard to be clean. You don't have to beat your back. You don't have to crawl down the aisle on your knees. It's not hard to get clean. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. It's not hard to get clean, dear friend. All you got to do is come to him. Confess your sins, and it says that he will cleanse us. So many people never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit has convicted them, and I'm talking about more than just a temptation. I'm talking about more than just stumping your toe. I'm talking about when you're doing something and you've done it for years and the Holy Spirit has convicted your heart. Dear friend, if you want victory, you better give it up. You better surrender it. There's a lot of other people that never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they grieve the Holy Spirit. They grieve it. Scripture talks about grieving it. Listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He said, be careful. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, let's see how we grieve it. Paul tells us how. Let all what? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. If you want to grieve the Holy Spirit, that's the way to grieve him is just be an angry person. Be b mad. Be full of bitterness, and you're grieving the Holy Spirit. I can tell you right now, dear friend, if you're mad at your wife or if you're mad at your husband or you're mad at the children or you're mad at your neighbor, then, dear friend, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. 
Bible makes that absolutely clear. We grieve the Holy Spirit through anger. But he wants us and be what? Kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. He says that you and I are to be kind, we're to be tenderhearted, we're to be loving, not angry, not mad. God says that's not the way we're to be. And as long as I go through life angry, full of bitterness, full of wrath, you're not going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Won't happen. Now, let me just say this, folks. It's not hard to be angry. Uh, some people, you know, they don't understand that. You and I are flesh, okay? That's the way we come into the world. Have you ever read in the Bible about the works of the flesh? Huh? Ever read about them? Well, let's read about them. Talks about them. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Let's see what they are. Which are these? What's the first one? Adultery. I have people come to me and say, Oh, Brother Cox, I feel terrible. I committed adultery. Let me tell you something. That's just perfectly natural as far as the flesh is concerned. That God listed as the very first one is adultery. And I can tell you, if you're going to live in the flesh, you're going to have trouble there. That's what you're going to do. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, what's the next one? Hatred, contentions, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfishness, ambitions, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the like of which I tell you before, just as I have told you in times past, that those who practice such things will what? not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Please read that text carefully. That text doesn't say if you do it, you're going to miss heaven. It says if you what? You practice. Get it clear. See, I'm not talking about when you stump your toe. I'm saying you can't go through life a mad, angry individual and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can't do that, friend. If you're getting up every day mad, at your husband or mad at your wife, then, dear friend, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble. Can't do that. It says you're to be kind, loving, tender-hearted. This is what God expects us to be. So there's a lot of people that grieve the Holy Spirit through anger. That's how they grieve Him. They're mad all the time. You know, some people all the time want to make an excuse for it. I hear them say, well, my great-great-grandfather was red-headed. And my great-great-grandfather was red-headed. And my great-grandfather was red-headed. And my grandfather was red-headed. And my father's red-headed. And I'm red-headed. And I can't help myself. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. No. I cannot go through life angry and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It won't work. Follow me very carefully. The Bible speaks about wrath, and it says this. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. It says now... Be angry. It's possible to be angry and not sin. There's not anything wrong in being angry over a righteous cause. There's not anything wrong in being angry over an abused child. There's not anything wrong in being angry over a battered wife. That's not wrong. But even if you're angry for a righteous cause, the Scripture says don't let, your son, don't let the sun go down on that. In other words, if you're angry over something that is perfectly right, perfectly good, the Scripture says still don't let the sun go down on it. Why? I'll tell you why. Because it's unhealthful. 
Let me tell you what I'm talking about. You ever been in a place where uh, you were scared and you did something physically that normally you aren't physically capable of doing? Ever had that happen? Huh? Haven't you? I remember a couple of boys and I, we were teenagers and we were climbing this mountain. And we'd come to the place on the mountain where there was a cliff that went just straight up. It really wasn't very high. And, uh, but we didn't want to try to go around. We wanted to go on up over it. And so we were standing there jumping, trying to jump up and get the edge of that cliff and pull ourselves up. I tried. I just couldn't jump quite that high. The other fellas tried. They couldn't either. And as we were jumping, we weren't paying attention. And down at the bottom in these rocks, out of a place there, came this great big old rattlesnake. And I mean, we heard those rattles and we looked down there and all three of us made it up there. <laughs> now that's what I'm talking about. Okay. That's when you're afraid and your body secretes adrenaline and you're able to do something you normally can't do. There's not anything wrong with that. That's the way God made you. And that's not, will not hurt you. But when you're angry, when you're mad, your body will secrete adrenaline and it will stay up. And if it stays up for a prolonged period of time, that's unhealthy. And there's people that suffer from rheumatism and from ulcers and stuff because they are angry people. God said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Makes that clear. Now, he gives us some real good advice. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now, I said, keep your heart. Watch your heart with all diligence, because out of it is the issues of life. You see, when you and I are born, when we come into this world, uh, we are born on the throne. You understand that, don't you? Especially those of you that have children. You know, when children are born, they're on the throne. If you're not careful, they'll get on yours too. That's just the, you know, that's the way we are. And you're, you're raised, you go through life that way. You know, you say, I'm able to take care of myself. I can handle this. I'm perfectly all right. I don't need any help. Okay, on the throne. If you're on the throne, you know what's working? Huh? The works of the flesh. Now, God gave you something called a mind, a brain. This brain that God gave you is a great big, or I shouldn't say great big, it's not big in size, but in, in its ability and capacity, it is a huge filing cabinet. Everything that you see, everything that you smell, everything that you taste, everything that you do, everything is absolutely perfectly filed. I mean, it's filed absolutely perfectly. And you are capable of pulling things out of that filing cabinet. If you just can access it, you can pull stuff out that happened years and years ago. In fact, I could say something right here, right now. And some of the things that you haven't thought of in years, and every one of you that's old enough can just reach back there and access it and tell me exactly. For instance, all I'd have to ask you is, where were you? Where were you when John Kennedy was killed? And watch you. Just, and you, oh, I know where I was. See? Just, it's there. It's filed perfectly. We file all that away in our minds. And when we pull it out, when we pull it out and look at it, we think about it. We access it. The Bible refers that to that as the heart. When it says, keep your heart with all diligence, it's talking about your emotions because out of it are the issues of life. You see, because when you access this and you think about it and you dwell on it, those emotions produce actions. That's the way that works. Okay, let's see what happens. 
You're on the throne. See, you're, you're in charge. And like I told you, since you're on the throne, then the works of the flesh are going to be prevalent. And so you're going to find you putting into your mind such things, looking at magazines like Playboy and Forum and Penthouse and uh, some of those. You acquainted with those? And you ladies don't say too much. You know, there's some others that the ladies look at also. If you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the ones you keep under your mattress, you know. That's the ones I'm talking about, okay? And so we look at that, and our mind follow, files all that away. And I mean it files it away perfectly so that when you want to, all you have to do is pull it out, take a look at it, and it produces what is known in Scripture as lust. That's an emotion, and if you do that, it will cause you to commit adultery. Keep thy heart with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life. Let's just take a simple thing. You say, well, Brother Cox, I don't do anything like that. I, I, I don't do anything like that at all. Well, it says, you know, that if you are angry, mad, that you grieve the Holy Spirit, Let's say that you just simply do something as simple as look at the newspaper. Now, the newspaper's not full of good news. The newspaper's full of bad news. You see, it talks about hatred. It talks about selfishness. It talks about murder. It talks about jealousy. It talks about all the bad news. And so you fill your mind full of all that bad news. And then you take it out and look at it every once in a while. You know what I'm talking about. When you walk in the room and some people are laughing and you think they're laughing at you, that's what causes that kind of thing. Because my mind's dwelling on things that are negative, that are bad. And because my mind dwells on that, it produces anger and hatred and malice and wrath and bitterness, all those things, and it can cause me to commit murder. And let me tell you something. There's not one of you in this room that's not capable of committing murder. You see, it only took the son of Adam, one down from Adam, who was perfect, to commit murder. All you got to do is follow this little thing. And a lot of people grieve the Holy Spirit because they're angry. Now, it also says that many people never receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they quench the Holy Spirit. It says, do not quench the Spirit. How do we quench the Spirit? Well, Paul again tells us how we quench it. It says, rejoice what? Always. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Now listen carefully. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. How much am I to give thanks for? Huh? Everything. everything? You mean if my boy wrecks the car, I'm to thank the Lord for that? Huh? You mean if my wife runs off with another man, I'm to thank the Lord for that? Now you got quiet on me, didn't you? It says, in everything give thanks. Why? Why am I to thank God for the bad as well as the good? You ever thought about that? Why? Why should I thank God for things that are bad? Because, dear friend, if you don't thank God for the bad as well as the good, then you're on the throne. You're directing your own life. Only when you come to the place that you'll thank God for the bad do you turn your life over to Him. I must thank Him for the bad as well as the good. And many people quench the Holy Spirit because they are afraid, fear. That's how you quench the Holy Spirit is by fear. That's what brings it about. Quench it through fear. Now, a lot of things happen 
that really are never going to happen. A lot of people are afraid of things that never will take place. They live in fear. Let's take this. Let's say you're on the throne. You're running your own life. And we've been running a five-day plan here, you know, for people that needed help with smoking or with alcohol or with drugs. Let's say that you do something like smoke. And uh, so you see things that says uh, smoking might cause cancer or does cause cancer. I shouldn't say might. And so you read all that and your mind files all that away perfectly. You see, and then you get up more, one morning and you have this smoker's cough, you know, this deep cough and this terrible taste in your mouth. And all of a sudden, you begin to access all that that you read, and it produces within you insecurity, anxiety, fear. All that happens simply because I'm on the throne. I'm running my own life. I go through life worried, afraid, fearful, because I haven't turned my life over to the Lord. I'm running it myself. A lot of people in that situation. When you do that, you quench the Holy Spirit. That absolutely happens. Stories told of an old king. This old king was very, very wise. And they would come to the king, need a decision made, and the story said that the king had a ring on his finger, and before he would make a decision, he would open that ring and look inside it. Then he would close it up and he would make the decision. Everybody wanted to know what was on the inside of that ring. And the old king never would tell anybody. And finally he died. And when he died, the very first thing they did is they opened that ring up and looked inside to see what was in there. And inside it, it just simply said, this too shall pass. You see, most of us are afraid of things that will never, never happen. Especially if you're on the throne, if you're running your own life. You see, if you are quenching the Holy Spirit out of fear, or if you are grieving the Holy Spirit out of anger, or if you are unwilling to give up a known sin, all that takes place because of selfishness. That's what produces that, is selfishness. Self-centered. That's what causes it. The Holy Spirit cannot be poured out upon an individual that is in that situation. You see, God doesn't want us to be fearful. In fact, he says this. There is no fear in what? Love but perfect love cast out fear because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. You see, when I take my life and I turn it over to the Lord, then you find that fear begins to leave. It makes a great, great difference in my life. It says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, follow me carefully it says that I'm to take the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm to put him on the throne. When I put Christ on the throne, something's going to begin to happen. Now follow me carefully. When I put Christ on the throne, then he is going to begin to put into my mind good things. You follow me? I'm going to find that as good things are put into my mind, my thoughts are going to become good thoughts. Now, I read to you about the works of the flesh, right? There's something else called the fruits of the Spirit. You ever heard of those? Okay, this is what they are. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. All those are the fruits of the Spirit. And as Christ is on the throne and he begins to put good things into my mind and my thoughts begin to 
dwell on good things, you find that I begin to produce good actions. Now, follow me carefully. You can't do one thing. I mean, you can do absolutely nothing about your actions. I find people down here mucking around with their actions, saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. Making good year, New Year's resolutions and saying, oh, I won't do that anymore. And they're down here playing around with their actions. You can't control your actions. It says that you're no more able to do that than for a leopard to change his spots. I find some other people saying, well, from now on, I'm going to have good thoughts. Not going to think any of those thoughts anymore. I'm going to have good thoughts. You can't control that. You're monkeying around where you don't have any power. You can't do one thing at all about this. And I even find some Christians that think they can control this. They say, oh, from now on, I'm going to read my Bible. How many of you? Don't raise your hands. How many of you have ever said, oh, this year I'm going to read my Bible through? You can't do anything about that. You're playing where you don't belong. You can't do anything about it, dear friends. The only thing you can do is God has given you the ability to make a choice, and you can decide to put Christ on the throne. You can do that. You can say, I am going to put Jesus Christ on the throne, and when you make the decision to put him on the throne, then let me ask you, will he control what goes in your mind? You better believe it. Will he control your emotions? You better believe it. Will he control your actions? You better believe it. It makes all the difference in the world. Don't be playing around here, friend. Get down to the heart of the problem and take, of it here, take care of it here. Make the decision to put Jesus Christ on the throne of your life. It'll make all the difference in the world. You see, Paul spoke about it. In the book of Titus, he said, For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. We've all been there. Every one of us. We have been disobedient. We have found ourselves living in lust, we found ourselves hating people, disobedient, all those things. Paul said he was once there. Something happened. Listen carefully. But when the kindness and the love of our God, our Savior towards man appeared, Paul said, you know, I saw an individual that was completely different. He said, I saw someone who was not angry. I saw someone who was altogether lovely. I saw someone who was kind, gentle, tender-hearted, and it changed his life. Listen. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, Oh, no, dear friend, don't get down over there, you know, and start monkeying around with your works. Get right back to the first part. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he what? Saved us. And dear friends, I feel a sermon coming on and I can't. It's too late. But when it says there that he saved us, and then it says by the what? The washing I'm so thankful that the Scripture consistently over and over says that he saves us and then washes us. I'm so glad it doesn't say that he washes me and then saves me. You know what I'm talking about? I'm glad God loves me just like I am. Boy, that makes a great, great difference to me. This idea, you know, some people say, well, when I get all everything taken care of and I get all cleaned up, I'll come to the Lord. Well, forget it. You're never going to get there. Never going to make it. Say, well, when I get over my anger, 
I'll come to the Lord. When I'm not mad anymore, I'll come to the Lord. When I, when I get rid of this sin, but right now I've got to get rid of this sin before I can come to the Lord. I'm glad God doesn't say that. It says he loves us, it says he saves us, and then he washes us. Okay? By the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. You see, it just simply says he pours out the Holy Spirit upon us. He pours that out upon us. And dear friend, if, you, if you've got a sin, a sin that the Holy Spirit has absolutely convicted your heart of and you're unwilling to give it up, tonight I'm asking you to surrender it. If you're grieving the Holy Spirit, if you're mad at your children, if you're mad at your mother or your father or your husband or your wife or your neighbor or the teacher or your employer, then tonight, dear friend, I'm asking you, come to Jesus, turn it over to him. If you're living in fear, you're quenching the Holy Spirit, every day is full of torments for you because you're afraid, then tonight I'm saying, come to Jesus. He'll give you peace. He'll make your life happy. Make it all together different. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thankful that you're willing to take us just like we are, to wash us and make us clean. Willing to take away all the anger and all the bitterness and the fear all the sins that so easily beset us and make us, each one of us, unworthy as we are, thy children. Tonight, while our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask those of you here tonight that the Holy Spirit has convicted you I mean, he's convicted you of a sin and you've been unwilling to give it up. You've done it over and over and over again. I'm going to ask you tonight to make a decision to put Christ on the throne and give that up. And I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come forward. There may be some of you here tonight that are having a real struggle with, struggle with anger and with bitterness. You're mad. You've fought it for years. Grinds at your soul. Cuts you right in the pit of the stomach. And tonight you'd like to get rid of that anger, that bitterness. Then I'm going to ask you also to get out of your seat and to come. And those of you here tonight that are having trouble with fear, you're afraid. You live in fear all the time. You like release. You'd like to have freedom in Christ Jesus. I'm going to ask you also to get up out of your seat and come tonight. Put Christ on the throne. If you would like to have victory in your life, you'd like to have freedom, simply as we pray, just step out from where you're at and come tonight.